four. Organization. <laughs> Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging projects, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour, whether you're listening to us through one of the 16 radio stations that is broadcasting our program this year in 2020, through our radio app, through our website. That website is thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. Under the Season 4 tab at the top of the page, Podcast Replay or In-Studio Video Replay, thank you for taking time to be with us. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. You can get a hold of us in a couple of different ways. You can do such by emailing us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, gardentalkradio at gmail.com, or you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Get a hold of us anytime, whether you have a question at uh, 4 in the afternoon on a Tuesday or during the show right now, you can... Give us a call, and if we can't get to you, we will give you a call back and answer the question of the problem that you're facing. This program is for you, about you, uh, to help your garden grow better, make your grass look greener, your trees grow taller and fuller, as well as landscaping, preserving what you grow, and everything in between indoors and out. we got a show for you today. We're going to talk about the importance of bats on your property, as well as over-repeated inaccurate garden information and our uh, an author our guest will be author rose hayden smith will be with us and your garden questions so let's get into the topic of the segment one here is the importance of bats on your property holly many people feel bats are and uh, they don't want them on their property right yeah i was just going to say that they feel that the bats might harm them or harm their children or harm their pets there's a lot of myths about bats but if you live in more, most parts of the United States, and I think pretty much everywhere in the United States, it's just a brown fruit bat is what, what we have here. And it's not, it's not bad. It's not a bad bat. Well, it's just like anything. If you start poking at a bear, a bear is probably going to attack you. If you start swatting or, uh, agitating the environment in which the bats are living in, whether it's a bat house or the eave of a barn or wherever the case is, you're probably going to have some uh, problems to deal with if you cause problems for them. Right, yeah, and most of the time you're not going to see the bat anyway. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Whenever back home, whenever we would hunt, you know, bow hunting, you would hunt right up to dark, so you would walk under the edge of the field, and you would see these things coming out of the woods, and those were bats. Okay. Well, bats are friendly, and they're beneficial because they do eat One bat, two, two bats, ha-ha, uh-huh. uh-huh. Mr. Count. Yeah. What, was it Mr. Count? Was that his name? Count. Count Dracula? No. Yeah, it was Count Dracula. I don't know. Somebody will email us, let us know that we got that completely wrong. Because <laughs> um, uh, so, he had bats on right. Sesame Street. Yeah. Right. So bats eat bad insects. So they eat mosquitoes mostly, um, but they also eat bad beetles, things like that, that are going to attack your plants um, or attack you. And they can, okay, so a regular bat can consume up to 70% of its body weight in one night. And then. A pregnant bat can consume up to 100% of its body weight in one night. Okay. It's Count Von Count is who the character. Not, is it really? Yeah. Oh. The, the magical world of the internet. They have that oh, on, yeah, com- the they count, have, yeah, they had the that count. on computers now, the internet. Mm-hmm. And that's what it told me. Now mm-hmm. we know that everything on the internet is fairly accurate. That's what, that's what Abraham Lincoln said. Is that what he said before he invented pants or something? Mm-hmm. Is that what? Okay. Mm-hmm. Back to the topic of bats on your property. So bats can eat a lot of bad insects that can be detrimental, you know, like uh, that can be bad for us. Right, like mosquitoes. Right. That's what they're most known for. And that's good. It helps control the mosquito population. And that's definitely one. They also can eat those bad beetles. So if you have something like 
like a potato beetle or what's another beetle that might Japanese beetle, Japanese beetles, cucumber beetle. They eat, they eat those. Yeah. Uh, with the bats now, you can, there are some ways in which to, uh, in, you know, bring them in on your property. Now, based on if you're in the country or if you're in a municipality, a home, to, a homeowner association, whatever the case is, there are things called bat houses. And based on the bat house, it's probably about six inches thick and it can be any size width wise. So you're looking at, you know, the size of a, a two by four, or two by six. Uh, and people will mount these on poles in the center of their property. They will uh, uh, attach them to barns or, um, you know, upper E's of houses. You don't want it right down on the ground. You, you want it elevated, and there's proper uh, instructions on how to do such. You can make your own bat house, or you can purchase a bat house online. There's several great um, locations in which you can do such, but you can bring them in, and they can be hundreds of bats in one of these little houses. And then- Before you... Before you commit to this, you want to find out where where you might have to put this bat house because I know that they want it so that there's sun on it during right. the day because the bats want that warmth. And then um, also there needs to be up high. It has to be easy for them to get into without fear because they use the sonar. Mm-hmm. So without fear of a predator or maybe running into a tree or something like that. Uh, with the, the bat houses and all such... Uh, you don't necessarily have a, have to have a bat house. You can, you can bring them in other means. Now, bats do help pollinate fruit, uh, fruiting plants. Now, a lot of times, you know, we see, we, we think, you know, what pollinates a tomato plant or, well, so p- tomato plant's a bad example because they're self-pollinating. A squash plant or a watermelon or, you know, it's gotta be bees. It's gotta be bees. Yes, bees do a tremendous percentage of pollination. And without bees, we lose a tremendous percentage of the, produce in which we are consuming on a daily basis but there are ants there are wasps there are bats there are insects that we don't even know exist uh on our property that are pollinating flowers night and day butterflies yeah hummingbirds all sorts of stuff and you're right yes we don't know what we don't know sometimes the extent of what is pollinating and a lot of bats in the southern portion of the united states and even um other parts of North America or Central America, they will pollinate things like guava, avocados, mangoes, and guava, avocados, mangoes, like fruits that grow on the trees, peaches, okay. um, pears, even apples. So, yeah, they will aid in pollin- pollination of, of that. Now, based on the quantity of bats you have, and if you have a bat house, some people will take the extra step and create... Uh, a tray, I guess, would be a trough uh, lower below the house itself, several feet. So when the droppings uh, are released from the bat, it can be captured in this tray or trough, and it can be utilized as fertilizer. Yeah, it's bat guano. Bat guano. Mm-hmm. Now there are industry, there are uh, fertilizer industries in which they have products that are bat guano fertilizer. Some of them, you got to read the details and you got to know who it is. Some of them are, you know, they're harvesting it humanely, and other ones are going in these caves with very large equipment and disrupting the whole ecosystem to harvest the bat guano in order to sell it to consumers like you. So it's always good, no matter what industry or product in which you're buying, whether it's fertilizers or tires for your car, to do a little research and see where the chain of command is and how the practices of that particular company uh, works, and if it falls in line with what you think should be the right way to go about doing certain things. Right. That's definitely, yeah, it's up to you sometimes to do your extra research if you want to. Cheap, um, cheaper is not always better. Right. So that's a good point. And then um, bats are cool because they also spread seeds for reforestation, um, so if you live in an area or know somebody or just know of an area that is low on forestation, they will spread those seeds. Um, it's through their droppings. Uh-huh. So they'll eat the plant. And then it, so it's like automatically like planting a seed with fertilizer. Right. Um, and some of these caves, when you go into the, these tropical areas or even just in uh, areas here in North America, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bats go in and out of these caves every night. When they, you know, because they're nocturnal, uh, they, that means they, they go and do their thing at night and they come back and sleep during the day. So that's, uh, spreading, that's, uh, does a lot of good benefits to the, uh, land. 
Right. And that's correct. There's, um, there's, it's beneficial that the bats exist for many reasons. And you want to keep that in mind that if you see a bat on your property, you see a bat around, whatever, it's not bad. Now, um, now disclaimer on that. If it's, if it's trying to attack you, there's a couple of things you need to be aware of. One, are you near where it's living? Or two, there might be something wrong with that bat that it's gone, it's got a, a problem, uh, uh, disfigure, you know, it, there's something wrong mentally with that bat where it's got a disease or sickness that is physically trying to attack you. So either one, you're too close to its residence, or two, it's got something that is going to, it, it's, you know, needs to be put down. But the likeliness is very low. Oh, very small, yeah. but it needs to be, uh, you know, announced. So that, that, yeah. at that point, you would call animal control if they still exist. I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and for you country people out there, you know what to do. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'm a city folk, so you call animal control. Well, there was uh, a G. Gordon Liddy. He was an old talk show host out of Florida. He was on a, he always said, uh, shoot it, shovel it, and shut up about it. That's what he would say mm-hmm. about certain things in life. Yeah. Well, so I believe it. Yeah. You know, when when I was just on vacation last week, I'm pretty sure we heard, we, you know, we were kind of. Did in, you find Bigfoot? In the woods ish. And we, I'm pretty sure we heard a shotgun because it was not fireworks. And maybe somebody was shooting it, shoveling it and shutting up. Yeah. It. Yeah. So, yeah. So bats are our friends and they're beneficial to any garden, any homeowner um, and to yourself. So thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our 23rd show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talk lessons we have learned this year in segment two, problems you are dealing with in your garden, and authors, uh, our, sorry, author Karen Chapman. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, or we'll make it even easier. You just send us an email to gardentalkradio@gmail.com In the subject line, put show 22. And we will send you the link. We will be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about over-repeated wrong garden information. You are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens understand that healthy soil is always the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the micro life needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jim's will stimulate life in the soil and supply all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% bioavailable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. Chicken Soup for the Soil is an amazing fertilizer that will increase the quality of all the fruits and vegetables you grow. Perfect for gardeners, growers, and farmers. To find out more about Chicken Soup for the Soil and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it. Tomatosnaps.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. 
Blue Mills 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. You ever have that person in your life where the answer is always the same no matter what the problem is? We're going to talk about inaccurate, repetitive information that's been pumped out on social media for a long time. Uh, and we can, can I get an example of this? This, this, what is it? Like when they say it is what it is or what? It is what it is. Oh, it's it just a scratch. Spit on it and put a band on it. It'd be fine. That's what you say. Well, I, that's not for everything. <laughs> But we're going to talk about gardening information. If you spend any time on social media platforms, uh, you'll see at this time of year repetitiveness, uh, repetitive images of blossom inrod, of squash vine borer, or, you know, z- zucchini plants flat on the ground. And the answer that's given is a repetitive answer and it's not the right answer very often, at, if any. Uh, so we're going to go through some of these very Wrong, repetitive answers, so you do not uh, get caught up in this, um, the lies, I guess, of the wrong information. Maybe misinformation. Misinformation, so you it's, could... Or even just like, you know, people just thinking whatever. So the first one is um, Epsom salt on blossom and rot. Yeah, just add some uh, Epsom salt and water it in. Epsom salt, Epsom salt. Now, for all of you people who are chemists or non-chemists, we can go back to eighth grade biology, or I guess, no, eighth grade chemistry, and, you know, Epsom salt, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. Blossom in rot is the lack of available calcium being brought up through the root system into the fruit to develop it correctly. I'm just a country boy, but I know those two things don't add up to the same thing. So... What is occurring is Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate, is very beneficial to plants. makes it greener, makes the blossoms bigger, the whole deal. It doesn't substitute magne- It doesn't substitute for calcium. No, it does not. Um, so, so what it is, we'll, we'll just tell, yeah. we'll yeah. say so that people aren't confused. Um, what it is is that a lot of times what happens is we plant our tomato plants and whatever, and then we have some rain. We don't think about you know, how we might be heading towards less rain and a lot of stuff gets locked up in the soil and your plants don't have access to it. And one of those nutrients is calcium. So what you do is you hear from your friend Fred, oh, just toss some Epsom salt on and water it in. But you're watering, you're watering the plant essentially, and then it releases that calcium back into the plant. The the plant is able to... The Epsom salt's doing other things. It's not fixing right. the problem. Right? The plant is able to access that calcium again and that's what fixes the problem. It doesn't fix the fruit that is currently damaged on the plant. It fixes the next next round of fruit producing on the plant. Potato towers. This is where you plant uh, a four by or you create a four by four foot square box. You plant the potatoes at the base of the box, cover them with soil like you would in the ground, and then as they emerge, you put boards up around the side. And by the time the season's over, you've got a four foot by four foot square box. That's three foot high or four foot high or fill in a blank of footage high or meters high. And you've got potatoes coming out of the top. And the, the myth is, that's what it is, that everywhere the soil touches the stem, more tubers are going to develop. And that's simply not how a potato plant grows ever in no form or fashion. The only thing that this would potentially uh, be beneficial to you is if you do one layer of potatoes those emerge, you put soil on top of it, and then you put another layer of potatoes, and you go in you know, that type of thing. You stair-step it up that every time the potato greens emerge, you plant another layer of tubers, cover them up, that type of thing. But one layer of potatoes, the base of the, the potato tower, does not work. It never produces. There's hundreds of videos of how to do it, hundreds of videos of planting it. 
dozens of videos of failures and no videos of success. Right. So that's that's one. And then the next one we have here is leaving rings on canning jars for storage. So a lot of times you'll think, and I'm this makes like this makes sense. I can see how it makes sense is to leave the ring on your canning jar just because that's how you canned it. The convenience. The convenience, right? So the problem with leaving your ring on the candy jar or canning jar is that you're canning something that's pressurized. So it sh- it should be sealed. It's vac- it's- vacuum, not necessarily vac- pressure. Yeah, vacuum. Yeah. Um, so it should be properly sealed. And when it's properly sealed, you don't need to have the ring on there. So with that being said, say there's some sort of reaction that's caused inside the jar. It'll pop the lid off. If you have the ring on there, it might break the jar. Or if you have the ring on there and the lid wants to pop off, it might re- it might reseal itself, and that would be a problem too. So it's just best to s- to store them without the rings. Next one is uh, also for you, Holly. Uh, you and I see this very re- readily, a very popular one. Uh, they they can X Y Z product and they flip the jars upside down on the cabinet. Now that is not necessary. That's very old. It's unsafe, is it's it uns- not? Yeah, it's unsafe. Um, back 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 in the day, our maybe not my ancestors, but maybe your ancestors. <laughs> well, I, I remember to, mom to, canning with the paraffin yeah, paraffin wax. Yeah, yeah. So they would can out the paraffin wax, and then you would tip the jars over so the wax would. Stay at what would be the top, but the bottom. Complete a seal. Yeah, complete a seal. And that's why they would flip the jars over. So, but we don't do that anymore. Don't do it. So it's not necessary. It's not necessary. It's unsafe. Uh, you're trying to get a lid to seal while it's upside down with a bunch of food pressured on it. Doesn't make sense. No. It's not good. Uh, bunnies like marigolds. Uh, they but don't. bunnies don't, do not like marigolds. Marigolds is this, you know, magical plant you put around your garden and everything, uh, stays out of the garden and this, you know, get rid of, rabbits don't come in. Rabbits eat marigolds. They certainly do. We've seen them eat the marigolds. So, um, I don't know what kind of magical marigolds this, this, uh, myth uh, has, but no, that's not how it works. The best thing to do for your garden, if you have pests like rabbits, you just want to put a fence around your garden. A, a two foot tall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, you can use Deer Defeat. Uh, use coupon code TW, uh, coupon code radio to save 10% on your order at DeerDefeat.com. It's an all natural deer, rabbit, and groundhog repellent. And it does work and it, uh, it's very affordable as well. Next one is, uh, um, you don't have to peel root, or yeah, the myth is, or the belief is that you don't have to peel root crops for canning. That is not true. It's unsafe, it's dangerous. It's unsafe, yeah, and dangerous. You want to peel potatoes, carrots, um, beets. Anything, anything that was under the ground, yeah. you need to peel it because particles of dirt and other bacteria right. gets into on, that, yeah, gets on that there's skin. There's good and bad things in all of our soil, and that. You don't want to transfer that to the canning process. Yes, you are going to wash that, but just peeling it off does help prevent um, additional problems. If you follow the instructions from the National Home for Food Preservation, ball canning, better homes and garden, they all say peel b- and dice before putting uh, into the jar for canning. So you got to follow the instructions. Uh, Eggshells offer immediate results. That's not true. Pow- Eggshells ha- are calcium. And people will say, oh, you just throw a couple of crushed eggshells in the hole, the planting of the tomato, or sprinkle around the top of the tomato, which that doesn't make any sense either. Spread, just crush it up and sprinkle around the top of the tomato and fix that blossom in rot problem. That doesn't work because the breakdown process of the calcium, the, the eggshell to a usable form for the microbes to break it down and take it into the plant and up you, takes about 12 to 18 months. 18 months. If you dry it out in the microwave for about a minute, pulverize it to a powder, Plant, use it at the time of planting your tomatoes if you feel that you have to add calcium, which most soils you do not. Uh, that is a much more readily available, uh, per, uh, material that powdered eggshell than a crushed eggshell would ever be. So, uh, just because it's an eggshell and it has calcium doesn't mean it fixes all the problems right away. Uh, nothing grows under a black walnut tree, Holly. Yeah, this is not, this is not true. And there's, um, there, I get why people say that because of that jug, juglong. The poison the tree puts out and can put out up to 80 feet beyond where the tree was at. 
in order to basically protect the tree from being invaded by other species. Uh, but there's a lot of yeah, and but there's a lot of stuff that will grow underneath it, and you can definitely, um, you can definitely do research. There's all sorts of things. There's all sorts of flowers. There's all sorts now, of shrubs. Now, if you try to plant tomatoes or peppers or potatoes, they're not going to do well. There's specific varieties that do well um, on that uh, underneath that tree. So you can keep that in mind. And if you're trying to grow in a place where a black walnut tree was currently at, there's no means of tillage to loosen or evaporate or burn off that juglong poison. It just takes time and it can take decades in some instances. So you'd want to go to raised beds. You'd want to go to straw bell gardens, something, a straw bell garden method, something like that. If you have no other means to grow where that tree once was, was you can it, do it that way. I was trying to look this up, yeah. but I think it's blueberries or blackberries or something that does well with that. But yeah, definitely do your research um, that you can grow. Uh, I have a black thumb. Yeah. So I, I hear this a lot. I can't probably grow because, anything. Probably because I work in an office. I mean, well, now I, now I work from home, but I worked in an office, and people would say, "Oh, you're, you know, you're such a good gardener. I admire that. I can't grow anything. I have a black you gotta thumb." You got to water the stuff, right? And I think the thing is, is that you don't have a black thumb. You have to, but you have to want to commit to to growing. And that's the thing is, like, just like having a child, you got to feed the kid, and you got to wipe the kid's rear end, you got to water <laughs> the plant, and you got to take care of it, and you got to, yeah. you know, you, you, a hor- having a horse. A dog, a cat, what yeah. have you, you know, like I we maybe it's less less detrimental if the 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 dog passes away versus you know something else. Uh, but like we don't we don't have, um, you know, we don't have a parrot because maybe we don't want to take care of a parrot. Well, if you get a parrot, you you got to get a pet that doesn't outlive you. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. that'd be like getting a tortoise or something. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, so maybe maybe you don't have a black thumb. Maybe you just don't have the commitment. And that's okay. Maybe right. it's not your time to do that. You have other priorities. Maybe when you get older or whatever, kids move out. And just like golf. Yeah. You're not good at golf until you practice a lot. It's just like gardening. You're not good at gardening most likely if you're, you know, if you've never done it before. But you've got to listen and learn and watch and, and learn from your mistakes. So you can certainly do that and it work very well. Everything will cross pollinate. Everything. Everything. Everything, everything. <laughs> everything cross pollinates in the garden. So. <laughs> So some people do think that they think like okay if I grow these a tomato squash, a tomato cross with a a cucumber. A, a cucumber and then you got a tomato cucumber you know something like that there are <laughs> like species that do cross right and then the other thing is is that if you have um, but different families don't different, cross yeah. a pepper is not going to cross with a leek an onion's not going to cross with a potato that type of thing it doesn't happen that way. Now, a zucchini will cross with a, a, a butternut squash or a spaghetti squash. That happens. That's that's part of the that is part of the family there. So there is some of that. And tomatoes cross with tomatoes. Very small chance unless you physically work towards it. Same thing with peppers. Uh, th- those are small, more lower chances of cross pollination. Cucumbers are a higher percentage of cross pollination. But yeah, just because you got peppers next to onions doesn't mean you're going to have an onion pepper. It right. doesn't work. Or, or what, what is it you plant? You, people would say that you plant like a hot pepper next to a tomato, you would get a hot tomato. That's not how it works. It's not how it works, no. no. Just like those ladies in the commercials. And even if it works. did work, even if that was the case, you're not going to get a hot pepper this year because the seeds are not, the, the seeds in which you planted this year are pure seeds. The cross is going to happen if you save the seeds from that zucchini that got crossed with the butternut squash. You save those and you plant those next year, that's when that morph will develop. The current year seeds on the current plant is not going to create some weird species. It just doesn't work that way. Right. Yeah. So that is um, a, f- a few of these. Yep. Have- and it's hot outside, Holly. Uh, it's midsummer, and the Japanese beetles are here to stay unless you do something about them. What can we do about them, Holly? Well, you you can prevent them from destroying your garden or your life. Some of you have. Some or, of you have, have already done such through phylum bioproducts. Yeah, and they you want to control them, um, and you can use a granular product. It can be spread onto your turf to control these grub invaders. This is developed by phylum bioproducts. It's a naturally occurring bacteria 
GrubGon is a non-chemical BT product that specifically targets only certain scarab pests, and it is safe to use around bees and other beneficial insects. If you've got the beetles flying around, uh, Beetle Gone is the only organic water dispersible powder that you can spray directly on your edible plants. To find out more, go to phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Do not let the bugs win. You be the victor of your garden. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, Dr. Rose Hayden Smith, author, will be with us. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. For all your indoor growing needs, equipment, and supplies, it's WeGrowIndoors.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, rootmaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. It's the middle portions of summer, and your projects may not be completely done, and you need more material. Well, Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center has those items for you. 40 varieties of bulk material, largest in the area. You can find them at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton and Greenfield. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220. You can visit them online at bluemails.com to see all that they have available. You can pick it up or they can deliver it right to your property, right to your job site. So get your jobs done so you can enjoy the rest of your summer. Blue Mails Landscape and Garden Center, bluemails.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guests for this week. Dr. Rose Hayden-Smith is an author, historian, and food systems expert. She has a passion for the American gardening programs of World War I, and she is often called the Victory Grower. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to chat with you both. Well, not, thank you for taking time out of your day, not only to, to help educate Holly and myself and talk with us, but all of our listeners from across the country and all of our stations. So um, not many people, I'm not sure how many people are familiar, but what is a Victory Garden? Okay, so Victory Gardens originated in the United States during World War I as part of home front mobilization. They were initially called Liberty Gardens and then quickly were renamed Victory Gardens. And they were modeled on successful programs in the United Kingdom and Canada. 
And they also built on previous um, United States experiences in gardening, um, including the popularity of school garden programs, um, you know, relief gardening efforts. And, and they reemerged in World War I, in World War II. Um, and it was in World War II, Victory Gardens were absolutely the iconic home front mobilization. Um, you know, in World War I, the, the programs were, there were several different kinds of programs that were organized by different groups in, that were public or, and private, you know, um, sort of collaboration. And they encourage school, home, community, and workplace gardens. And they also focused on food conservation and food preservation. Well, there can be a lot of parallels drawn from the World War I time era and today. Uh, there's a, there was a pandemic back then. What are some of the other parallels that you see people showing interest in growing their own food today as they did back then? Well, I, you know, I have to tell you that the parallels to me between World War One and today um, are, you know, there there are lots of them. Uh, not only was there a pandemic, also with um, not effective medical treatments, you know, no antivirals or antibiotics to treat uh, to treat secondary infections in World War One. But there were also um, there were a lot of issues with civil unrest um, on the American home front, um, you know, during World War One. Um, there were concerns about food security. There were concerns about disruptions in the food supply. And there were also big divisions between urban and rural in that period in American life. Uh, one of the things that was really surprising to me when I first started studying this topic was the fact that uh, there was also, you know, uh, more than a 100 years ago, concern about kids not knowing where their food came from and where the next generation of farmers might come from. So lots and lots of similarities and I also think, too, just the um, the overwhelming interest in gardening right now. I mean, you know, you two have been in this for a long time, and um, I don't know what you're seeing, but it's um, the interest is absolutely overwhelming. Yeah, I definitely agree. Now, um, well, we see we see the interest more this year than we've ever seen, and I'm just looking at statistics of what's coming in on our end. Uh, new gardeners, a lot of questions of people whom we didn't even know had a garden or was interested in growing a garden. They're asking us questions that a, a new gardener would and should ask uh, because of the situation that we're all in. Oh, for sure. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so you are a food systems expert. So what is that and how does that apply to even just someone growing some tomatoes on their apartment patio? Okay. That is such a great question. So, um, you know, the food system is a term that um, a lot of us throw around. But what does it really mean, right? So, you know, food system encompasses all kinds of activities that are involved in bringing food to our tables. I mean, there's the laboratory science, um, you know, like um, research around seeds and all sorts of things. There's the production and the harvesting of food, the processing, distribution, and then, you know, the our consumption of it. And what I like to tell people is that everyone eats and everyone has a stake in the food system. And I actually became interested in the larger food system after I became a gardener because, um, you know, gardening was um, such a, an important activity to me. And then you look at it within the context of, yes, it's home food production for most of us and on a pretty modest scale. And certainly what I produce in my home garden um, it doesn't um, take away my need to actually, you know, buy food from farmers, right? right. They, they can grow a lot of things I can't grow. Um, and I have found that it's just a great, gardening is a great activity 
to get people to start thinking about the larger context of food in America, food and agriculture. Well, that's the thing. Back in uh, you know the World War One, everybody probably knew somebody who was a farmer if they didn't live on a farm. Nowadays, there's a lot of disconnect that you've got to go through. Oh, well, I think, well, no, let me check. A lot of people, there's not that connection of, hey, I know a farmer. Well, I think I know somebody who might know, who kind of knows. They think they might know a farmer. It's very, very distant now compared to 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah, and and actually, um, you know, there's if you look at it, there's been a, a real decline um, in the percentage of people in our population that are working directly with agriculture. Right? It's just a, a very small percentage now of people in this country, um, although the impacts of it are really outsized. And I'm really fortunate because I live in a county that is um, a major agricultural producer of fruits and vegetables, um, you know, a leading strawberry producer, lemons, avocados, probably the number one celery producer in the United States. So um, I, I'm lucky because I know a lot of farmers, but I agree with you. Um, but I, I do want to, you know, let people know, because a lot of people may not be aware of this, is um, the 1920 census, Right at the sort of end of World War One was the first census that that revealed that, um, you know, we were really becoming a more sort of urbanized and suburbanized country. And so I would say that the 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 movement off the land um, is a larger trajectory that, you know, every year, you know, since, you know, probably the Civil War, you you know, you, you saw decline, smaller numbers, and obviously, too, our population is larger. Definitely. Now, your book, um, Sowing, Sowing the Seeds of Victory, American Gardening Programs of World War One. what inspired you to write this book? Now, I know you kind of talked about the food systems um, expert part, but what inspired you to write this book specifically? Okay, so this is a, this is a, a really interesting story. Um, I, you know, was a garden educator for, for decades. And um, I was, um, you know, just sort of noodling around on the internet one day because I you know, was kind of interested in Victory Gardens. And I found this obscure um, article that was about something called the United States School Garden Army in World War I. I had never heard of this. And it was sort of fell under the umbrella of the Victory Garden program in World War I. But basically it was this program that was run through the Bureau of Education, was sort of spearheaded it um, nationally. And it was one of the first sort of national curricular things. And it targeted urban and suburban kids to teach them how to garden and how to raise food, how to produce food. And what was really interesting about it is that it was funded by Woodrow Wilson with money from the War Department. And it was positioned as the work that these kids would do in their gardens was essential to national security. And so I was so intrigued. I started doing research about the World War I programs. And I actually... Um, drove up to UC, made an appointment, drove up to UC Santa Barbara at the age of, you know, like not young, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and said, could I come get a doctorate in history here and do, have my dissertation be on these programs? And I was accepted to the program and, and basically the, the book was adapted from my dissertation. Wow. That's really neat. So I, I started I started graduate school. I started a doctoral program at age forty two. <laughs> Fantastic. That's awesome. Um so why should we look at history when it comes to things like growing food, changing food systems, even pandemics? Well, I you know, I'm fascinated by history, always have been. But what I see when I look at um, history is that there, you know, people have dealt with these challenges before, right? 
And maybe the larger context is different, but, you know, people have dealt with these challenges before. And I think um, particularly in what I've learned about these gardening models is that there are models and there are public policies and there are examples that we could learn from. Um, you know, I mean, this idea of, of framing food um, and what you produce in your community as being really important to national security. And then in World War II, when, when actual food security is pretty good in this country, the, um, the Victory Garden Program yeah, pivots to this new message around nutritional defense and that one of the best things that you can do as a citizen of the country uh, is to grow food in school, home, community, or workplace gardens and eat, use that food to eat well and improve your health. Um, so that you can, you know, be a, a contributing a really positive contributions to your society. And so I just think that there's an awful lot of, um, of good stuff that we forget about or that gets dropped and goes by the wayside. Well, and with the Vic- and, and I mean, yeah. look at now in this pandemic, everyone's baking bread and, and sort of rediscovering all these, um, wonderful things that our, our grandparents and great grandparents knew how to do. Yeah, and that's the thing uh, with the Victory Gardens, World War One, World War Two, even today, uh, there's there, you know there's COVID Victory Gardens that are popping up, and people are you know even if they grow a, a, a lettuce on their patio porch deck, a tomato, that's one less item that they are purchasing that. We know that not everybody in the world can grow based on where they're at. So if we can grow a little bit in our little patio porch deck garden, it gives everybody else the access to that pear or that tomato or that whatever it is that we would have taken from them. So it, it helps everything out, even your little you know few things that you grow wherever you're at. Well, and and if you have children, it's a wonderful you know science based activity. It's great. Um, it's great physical exercise. You know, it's and, you know, too, it's emotionally satisfying. It's relaxing. Um, you know, we can beautify spaces with gardens. I think that they're so important. One of the things that I always want to acknowledge is that, you know, gardening is a privilege and not everyone has access to land. And that one of the things that the historical models can also um, you know, tell us is the importance of creating spaces in communities and providing technical assistance and, if possible, supplies so that people can access this wonderful activity. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Uh, Rose, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to educate all of us on this. How can we p- find out more about you and how can we get the book? Okay, so you can find out more about me on my website, which is rosehadensmith.com. And I've got a link. Um, I write a blog uh, weekly, um, and I've got links to articles. I've got image, images on the website with historical information, all those beautiful posters. And I've got a link to um, to my book, so the publisher and Amazon. Well, Dr. Rose, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day and and the information you've shared with all of us. And thank you for having me. Talk to you soon. Will do. And when we come back, it's going to be your garden questions, our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program that helps your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Trim Bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finished collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come. Which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. World's coolest rain gauge.com. Need I say more? 
Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. You got a question, we've probably got an answer for you. You can submit your question at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can also give us a call anytime, either during the show or after the show at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Holly, let's go through some of the questions and see how many we can get through this week. Yep. So the first one we have here is our pine needles too acidic to use as browns for composting. And no. No. Uh, glad she asked the question here. Um, you do not have to. Oh, well, there was a, a compliment. Oh, there was a compliment. Oh, I am so glad I came across your site. It has a lot of valuable information. Keep up the good work. All right. Uh, that site that she, that she is referring to is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com containing, oh, somewhere around 1500 plus garden videos and, uh, I think we're at 130 some odd, uh, radio shows and a whole bunch of other stuff there for you to get lost in, uh, and blow your gardening mind. How about that? So yes, you can, uh, the pine needles are not too acidic to co- incorporate into your compost pile as browns. Uh, you do not want to incorporate more than 10% of the overall volume of your compost pile with pine needles. Pine needles on the tree, yes, are about a three and a half on the acidity scale. Acidity scale to alkaline, it runs from zero to 14, seven being neutral. Uh, most of our garden soils are between six, eight and seven, two, seven, three. Uh, and people will also use, and we have done such as well, use the pine needles as mulch. It does not make the soil acidic. That's another garden myth or a misconception, I guess, would be the uh, adequate uh, response to that. Uh, but it does take several years for the pine needles to physically break down to soil. So that's why we don't want to add too much in our compost pile, but it also makes a great mulch for our garden, whether it's a perennial bed around asparagus, something like that. Uh, if you're going to use it in a garden where you're going to till uh, yearly or multiple times a growing season, pine needles would not be the best uh, use uh, or choice for that mulching material. Now, next question is, is it okay that my Swiss chard is so floppy? They grew so tall, then they got knocked down um, just by normal watering. They're all in the dirt instead of growing upwards, crushed by their own weight or the weight of the water. Um, they still look green, doesn't look like it's dying. They're just kind of floppy. Well, Swiss chard can be harvested. What it sounds like here is that maybe the Swiss chard wasn't harvested at the regular intervals in which you should harvest Swiss chard. Swiss chard is not something, not a plant like a tomato where you have to let it grow all the way to maturity and then you're able to harvest the leaves. Swiss chard can be harvested anytime during the growing season. You want to harvest the outer larger leaves and then allow the smaller inner leaves to fully develop and then the rotation of the, the repetitiveness, to harvest the outside leaves, leave the little ones in there. So you can harvest it all the way through the season and Swiss chard, if for those of you who are not growing it and like the 
spinach, like spinach, it's a great alternative to spinach because spinach will go to seed bolt uh, early on in the season because of the day length and the heat uh, uh, that is predominantly available for most of us. Uh, spinach is also a good fall crop. But anyway, Swiss chard is a good substitute. Anything you can do with spinach, you can do with Swiss chard. And the if you want, it, you want more tender leaves, obviously you harvest it when they're earlier, not wait until they're fully mature. So that you don't have to wait for it to be a tree or a shrub. Go ahead and harvest it regularly, and you can utilize those um, very, very frequently in your kitchen throughout the growing season. Uh, okay, here, Holly. Are the leaves of sunchokes edible? Sunchokes or Jerusalem artichokes, based on where your what your culture is uh, right. and the term you use. Um, no, they are not edible. So the you're eating the roots, and you don't want to eat the you're leaves. You're eating the tuber. Or the tuber. Yeah, the tuber. Um, you don't want to eat the leaves or the stalk or the flower. So no. Uh, any tips on slowing the production of flowers that are occurring on my basil plants? Well, basil is, when it gets hot, it's going to tend to want to bolt. So what you want to do is you can pick the flowers off as soon as you see them. It's not going to make it last forever, but it will slow down that process. Also with the basil, uh, a lot of the time, it's if the roots get really hot, that is a signal to the plant to go into its next stage of reproduction, the flower stage. So if you can keep the roots cool with mulch in the hot summer, uh, an inch or two of mulch of pine needle straw, chemical-free, seed-free grass clippings, can actually reduce the soil temperature three to five degrees. Now, you may not think that's much, but if it's 100 degrees ambient temperature outside and the soil's 90 degrees, you knock that down five degrees, that plant is a very different level of happiness, uh, and you keep the soil moist, that's going to keep it even cooler. So you can keep that in mind when it comes to mulching. It doesn't only just suppress weeds and holds moisture. It actually can keep the roots cooler and the soil cooler from that ex- that excessive beating sun that uh, occurs uh, all summer long in a lot of places in this country. Uh, what is, speaking of, uh, let's go to the great state of Wisconsin where we live here. What is a good variety of eggplant to grow in the northern portions of Wisconsin, Holly? Well, in our great state? In our great state. Um, I think everybody's state is their great state and for, I don't know. Um, there might not, there um, might not always be the case for some people. Um, so you can grow. What, what, um, what eggplants are good to grow here in the northern part? Now, northern, yeah. we're in zone 5A in the southeast portion of the state for those who are listing in other regions the northern part there's a zone three up there they get like two days of summer that's really it and the, and the snow two ca- days. i mean it, it it's a very it, no you're right yeah you're it's right. very very short i mean they they're like 50 to 60 days shorter on frost free days than we are in the southern part of the state right so um well you can grow what's called finger eggplants or a white egg eggplant. Those are both good options because they only take about 65 days. Typical eggplant will take between 75 and 95, even 100 days based on the type. So uh, it makes a big difference when you're knocking 40 days off of the overall maturity. Now, obviously, both of these type of eggplants, the white egg, egg and it's really called white egg eggplant. It's a white eggplant. Um, these are very smaller size. These are not your traditional black beauty eggplants that you see in the grocery store or at the farmer's market that are you know the size you know, two or three or four pounds size. These are smaller, a uh, long pod or egg, you know, m- tinier, tinier fruit on it. So keep that in mind there. What's our next one here? One of my container cherry tomatoes all of a sudden has green aphids and ants. I was reading that the duo, duo are quite a pair. Sound like, sounds like the ants are guarding the aphids. How can I prevent both of them from hanging out on my tomatoes? I already removed them. Put down the aphids, put down coffee grounds and cayenne pepper. Um, yeah. So aphids, and if you see ants, you've got aphids. They work together because aphids suck the juice. Uh, uh, they're, the, they're the tick of the gardening world. They suck the juice out of the plant. And then what is they create what is called honeydew. That's that um, dry candy-like substance around the plant that the injection hole occurred. So then the ants take that back to their colony, and that's what they feed off of. So the ants protect the aphids because without the aphids, they don't get this honeydew, this sweetness treat that they can take back to the colony. But in order to get rid of the aphids, you can top dress the plants that are being affected, and really all the plants you can do this with, um, with uh, worm castings. Worm castings have a very 
beneficial and unique property in them in which when the aph- when the plant it's watered and the soil the the the, the um, worm castings get watered into your actual soil and those properties are picked up by the plant and when the aphid begins to suck the juice out of the plant that property which was in the worm castings now in the plant goes into the aphid and begins to dissolve the aphid from the inside out so it's um, an evil way to die i guess uh but it works very well it's very very good in that uh what are the things we need to be aware of Di- diatomaceous earth also uh can can help with this particular problem uh, diatomaceous, diatomaceous earth helps with a lot of problems. It's kind of... Uh, it's not a fix-all. It's not a fix-all, but and especially like you have to do your research. But yeah, it definitely helps a lot of problems. When you it can comes use to borax garden. and use a sugar a poison trap. Uh, to, if, you, to, if you have a septic... Septic system. System, thank you. Tank, whatever. Tank, whatever. What, what are you, what, you, you, are you looking to, for? You have, to be, <laughs> you have to be careful with borax. Uh-huh. Yeah. It can it can cause issues with that. Now, some aphids, some ants, that's okay because you have to have a balance. We can't have all beneficial insects. There's got to be a balance where, you know, the, the ladybugs have something to eat, which is the aphids, that type of thing. A ladybug, what is it, can eat like 5,000 aphids in a life, lifetime, something and a ladybug yeah. can live two to three years, something like that. Uh, so if you have some, it's okay. Now, if you have an infestation of ants or aphids or fill-in-the-blank bug, then you have to figure out, okay, now how can I control this? Is there an organic means or do I need to resort to a chemical means in order to get everything back into check? And then I can go back to the organic means and then nature can take care of itself. So you've got to figure that out, whether or not uh, one will work or the other will work or what you may need to be doing in order to get to that level of uh, you know control of the garden. Well, we are out of time, and we certainly appreciate yours. Miss any portion of this program, or you may want to revisit it in its entirety. You can do that a couple of different ways. How is that? Well, you can go to our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and click on the Season 4 tab at the top of the page. And you can check out past shows of this year, Season 2, Season 1, uh, Season 3, all of those. And uh, you can catch up on that. You can also download those on your favorite podcast-providing platform, uh, you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you want the link for this show, we'll send that out to you so you can have it for uh, your entertaining and educational purposes. You can also check out pa- uh, past videos on the website as well, in studio and in garden. Tell your garden friends and your fellow uh, buddies that this program's on the air. That's how our show is heard, how our show grows. Join us next week when we're going to talk about not all weeds in the garden are bad weeds. And our guest will be Sandra Smith. Your garden questions will be answered, too. That's next week, same time, same station. So until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>